When a problem arises, people turn to scientists for answers. The University of Washington 2006 Science Forum features faculty sharing research results on the world's most vexing problems. Mary Desis examines how the immune system may be used in the future to prevent cancer through the development of vaccines. David Eaton looks at the research on genetic, lifestyle, dietary, and environmental factors to puzzle out why some of us get cancer and others don't. Garrett O'Dell examines the use of mathematical models to shed light on how biological gene networks operate and how these models reveal the networks to be astonishingly robust, despite their unintelligent design. Buddy Ratner updates us on the progress of regenerative medicine and addresses the practical and ethical issues surrounding tissue regrowth and organ replacement. And Ray Hilborn provides facts to dispel the fears of a worldwide fisheries crisis and discusses the changing objectives of fisheries management. Join us in Puzzling Out the Science. Exploring Our World, Puzzling Out the Science is made possible by the University of Washington Alumni Association, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Office of Research, the College of Engineering, the School of Medicine, the College of Ocean and Fisheries Sciences, and the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. Additional funding for this program is provided by the University Bookstore and UW Medicine. Hello, I'm uh, John Slattery, the Vice Dean for Research and Graduate Education at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Uh, tonight it's a particular pleasure to be here with you as we um, get to showcase some of the remarkable research that's, that's going on here at the university, both in the College of Engineering uh, and, and the School of Medicine. Those are uh, Buddy Ratner's two homes. One of the hallmarks of the University of Washington is that it's not characterized by uh, faculty existing in independent islands, but it's a remarkably uh, interactive uh, institution. And some of what uh, Buddy will, in fact, all of what Buddy will be relating to you tonight is, is actually uh, a result not only of the work, um, the inventiveness of, of the faculty here, but also that uh, remarkably uh, interactive climate. If you happen to be a student here, for example, in uh, a department like mechanical engineering, it's highly likely uh, that you'll interact with people in, in different projects uh, from the School of Medicine, the School of Ocean and Fisheries Science, uh, even uh, law and, and business we allow to get into the fun parts of, of the campus and the research climate as well. So it really is just a remarkable place. In my history here, it's not at all unusual to hear faculty visiting from other institutions uh, remark uh, upon these qualities of, of this institution. And as I said, you're going to see some of that at, at play this evening. Uh, the speaker tonight is Buddy Ratner. Buddy is a professor uh, in, in chemical engineering uh, and in uh, bioengineering. And he's also the director, the principal in um, a program called UWeb, which is the University of Washington uh, Engineered Biomaterials uh, Program. And of course, you'll be seeing the results of, of that uh, consortium of investigators this evening. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm particularly delighted to uh, be able to introduce Buddy uh, because of the remarkable interactiveness of, of the work that he's going to be presenting to you. Um, the, the fact that it includes uh, and involves not only uh, faculty from a wide variety of disciplines and departments here at the University of Washington, but also Buddy has been very successful in pulling in and, and linking to the uh, local and particular uh, biotech uh, industry. Um, his work and the work of his colleagues actually does make uh, our lives substantially better. Please join me in welcoming Buddy Ratner. Well, good, e good evening. Appreciate people coming out. Um, I, I think I have a message that's pretty exciting tonight, and I'm hoping to, uh, to get you um, captivated by this whole story. Um, let's see, the, the title I chose was terribly complicated. Um, uh, all those words in it, repair, rebuild, enhance, tissue engineering, medicine, biology, entrepreneurship, ethics, 
I think we should touch on every one of those as we go through this evening. And there's a lot of interesting stories around those, those many words. So it, it kind of helped me to, to uh, de decompose my title in that way. Well, let, let, let's start here. This is um, kind of an interesting idea. When you think of, uh, of evolution, um, back in the era of maybe this sort of caveman-like fellow, uh, sort of from, a, from an evolutionary standpoint, humans basically just had to live long enough to pass on your genetic material. I mean, that's really probably what evolution is ultimately about. And by, you know, 25 or 30 or so, uh, most uh, people in particularly more primitive societies are getting toward the end of their uh, mating age. And uh, at that point, the saber-toothed tiger could, could come along and eat you up, and there would be no consequence uh, to the, um, uh, the genetic um, uh, ascendancy that, that uh, is sort of connected with, with the, um, the way we pass on genes. So, um, as I say, longevity was not an issue or even a, even a probability. A, a longevity was, was probably quite uh, exceptional. Uh, but now, I, I got some numbers, it's 2002, I probably should update it, but the average life expectancy in the U.S. is uh, 77.3 years. Um, and uh, because we're going well past this 25 or 30 age, we, uh, we simply wear out and we're easily damaged. Our, our hearts wear out, uh, our joints wear out, um, which is the kind of middle diagram here. And then uh, also, in, uh, unfortunately, in many uh, tragic situations, we um, uh, blow ourselves up or, or otherwise injure ourselves. That's, that's the reality of going through this 77-year lifetime. Um, the, uh, the National Institute of Dental Research, it's actually now called the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, the name changed, uh, had this on their website a few years ago, which is pretty, pretty interesting, and, and it would take a long time to read this whole thing. But they talk about the, the, demand, for reparative, the demand for reparative procedures is staggering in scope and cost, and, and uh, Americans suffer some, uh, millions of Americans suffer some type of tissue loss and end-stage organ failure. The total cost for these patients, this is the NIH's own estimate, $400 billion per year, each year, in, in, in repair or replacement. And that's uh, kind of a, an economic side of what we're up against. So if one should need repair or replacement, what, what kind of options do we have available? Well, uh, let's see. They're sort of the biomaterials, the, the uh, medical devices that are readily available today. They save lives. They improve the quality of life for millions. It's what I have studied for uh, uh, 34 years at this point at the University of Washington and uh, sort of typified by this hip joint. So that's one possibility. Uh, another possibility is that one might uh, get a transplant of, of uh, a tissue or organ. And certainly a lot of that goes on, but as I'll show in a moment, there's not nearly enough to deal with the total demands for this sort of thing. Uh, still another option is, is a life of altered, perhaps reduced functionality. Um, uh, some people can accept that and, and just do without the part that happens to be missing. But then on the bottom, there's two other possibilities, and one of them I'm going to circle here is tissue engineering which we'll talk a lot about, and regenerative medicine, which follows very closely on the heels of tissue engineering. And these open a whole new possibility, a whole new set of options, and, and that's really what we want to talk about. So uh, there's a justification for tissue engineering. I think tissue engineering can make a contribution. And I'd like to talk about three things to sort of introduce this. One is what I call the, the transplant organ shortage, why we don't have enough organs. Uh, another is, is the possibility of using animal organs for transplants, and then the limitations of these synthetic biomaterials that I work so well with. So the transplant organ shortage, um, here we have um, a diagram and some statistics that came off an interesting website. The web address, the URL is at the very bottom of this slide. If anybody's interested, get it to you in some way. But, but basically, if you tune on at any time, and the last time I tuned on, let's see, it was one January 21st at 3.50 a.m. I, I suspect I was working late that night. But uh, I looked up uh, how many candidates in the U.S. were waiting for transplants. 90,000 were waiting for transplants. And the other number is a little complicated, uh, but, but basically, 
through three quarters of the year, you know, maybe there, there were uh, 30,000 transplant available. So that means 60,000 people in that year are waiting for transplants that didn't have transplants. The, the bar graph talks about specific organs, and I won't be going into that right now. So basically, there's simply not enough transplants to go around. It'd be great if there were plenty, but we just can't do that. So um, uh, another possibility, and there's at least two or three commercial firms that are thinking about this, are transgenically engineering animals like a pig, for example, and the pig happens to be um, uh, reasonably close on the phylogenetic tree, phylogenetic tree to humans, and the pig is about the same size as a human, so people think pig organs might be a good possibility to use for transplants. But there's some issues there, too. Um, there are the ethical social concerns. There's probably one-third the um, uh, religions that occupy one-third of the population of this planet that really wouldn't tolerate a pig part put in them. Uh, pigs are very intelligent animals. There, there are a lot of groups that don't think that animals should be sacrificed just for to give a, a piece for a human. So we got those sort of things. There's immunologic concerns. That's one of the major scientific issues these companies are working around, but they haven't succeeded yet in getting a pig organ that is immunologically accepted in, the, in a human. And then finally, there's anatomical and functional concerns. Yes, a pig is similar to a human, but it's not a human. And also, just, just think about how long a pig lives. You know, a pig lives 15, 20 years. A human lifespan is uh, approaching 100 years. Uh, maybe the pig organs won't last very long either. A lot of complicated questions. I, I also have at the bottom some, some vocabulary that I'm actually going to be using in this talk. So we call the, the pig organ transplantation xenotransplantation. Uh, and um, a xenograft at the bottom is, is tissues or organs from another species. And an allograft are tissues and organs from the same species from one human to another, and an autograph would be taking your own tissue and reimplanting it back in your body. And all these are things that sort of happen or are thought about in tissue engineering. Okay, this third thing is the limitation of synthetic biomaterials. So, well, they don't grow with the patient. Uh, you get a synthetic heart valve, it'll work for many years, but it doesn't grow. It means we can't put them in children. Uh, because the children, show the child, as the heart grows, the child's heart grows, needs a, needs a reoperation. Uh, they don't fight infection, which natural tissue does. They don't uh, talk to the body. We'll actually talk a lot about how cells and tissues communicate with the body, and they, don't, they, don't, they just don't repair themselves. So yes, we use them, but they are really uh, quite a, a second to uh, natural tissue. And then finally, we have this thing called tissue engineering. So uh, this was a, a page from Business Week magazine um, and uh, a new era in regenerative medicine. And uh, they talked about the possibility of regrowing uh, bone, skin, pancreas, heart valves and arteries, saliva glands, urinary tract, bladder. The, I, I won't read the whole list because we'll actually be going through a number of these. But uh, it was quite uh, you know, an impressive spread within the magazine talking about the possibilities there. And then if we go to, to Time magazine in the year 2000, uh, the, in an article called The Hottest Jobs of the Future, the number one hot job uh, of the future was tissue engineers. It was sort of interesting because all 10 of them out there are probably wondering why this is the hottest job in the world. It's a field that quite, isn't quite there yet. 10 is, a, is an exaggeration. We'll, we'll even talk a little about how many there are. Okay, so what is this thing called tissue engineering? Let me give you a very quick, easy definition and then we can sort of get into some more interesting stuff. I call it using engineering principles, material science, and cells or tissues to reconstruct tissues or organs. So we're going to use engineering materials and biology or cells and tissues, and we're going to reconstruct tissues and organs. That's, that's pretty simple. A couple of examples. This is a material called dermagraft, uh, shown in its sort of surgical package. And uh, what the surgeon is taking out there and would put on a patient with a um, maybe a diabetic ulcer that, that didn't heal or, or a burn, uh, is a dressing that contains living fibroblast cells. These are allogeneic. These are from another human. It turns out this particular type of cell doesn't incite much of an a, 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 of a immunologic uh, reaction. Uh, but these particular cells give off, living, give off uh, uh, growth factors, chemicals, proteins, that induce or help stimulate the healing. 
One could just have an inert dressing, and it doesn't work nearly as well as the dermograph. So dermograph is one of the first examples of taking a synthetic material, taking living fibroblast cells, using it in medicine, and, and this whole thing was developed with some very elegant medical principles. Uh, here's one. This is the, from the April 4, 2006 Washington Post. I think there, there was also an article in the Seattle Times, if I remember correctly, but first bladders grown in the lab are transplanted. Uh, Professor Anthony Atala of Wake Forest University grew bladders in the laboratory, and uh, if your bladder goes, it's um, definitely uh, detrimental to your quality of life, but he took cells from the bladders of the patients, grew those cells up on a bladder-like scaffold shape and re-implanted them, and there are nine humans now that have laboratory-grown bladders in them, and one of them is functioning already four years. So this is looking very promising. There's, there's two examples. We'll have lots of other examples to go through this talk. Uh, there's a lot of interesting applications for tissue engineering, uh, besides ju just the, the top one here, tissue and organ repair and replacement. That's what I was talking about. But also things like um, cosmetic enhancement and alteration. Uh, that might be the first major one. We uh, go to, to such lengths and frankly take such risks to um, alter our body to some perceived standard of beauty or uh, acceptability. And uh, so one can start dwelling on the parts that people might want to, to replace. I, I won't even go there in this talk. But um, uh, then there's also the possibility of living devices to treat diseases, a, a living kidney or a liver, liver or treat Parkinson's disease with a living cellular device. Uh, food production, um, we know we can tissue engineer muscle. I'll show you some examples of it. What is meat? Meat is muscle. Uh, maybe someday we'll be tissue engineering filet mignons and Chateaubriand and uh, other cuts of meat uh, in a bioreactor that could potentially make even better tasting meat, uh, could potentially um, uh, take us out of this cycle that many people say is acceptable of, of eating animals. Uh, the possibility there. Uh, biosensors, one can use living tissues for, for sensors. Uh, one can uh, use these as factories to produce important biological molecules, drugs. Uh, one can study human diseases and pathologies, and, and um, one can do drug and toxicity testing uh, in uh, living organ constructs. So if we can do this tissue engineering thing, there's lots of interesting possibilities. And this, is, this is kind of my diagram of um, what might be tissue engineered. Um, and uh, this is it's even a partial list, but uh, there's at least two or three companies, again, talking about this cosmetic thing, that are doing tissue engineered hair uh, for obvious reasons but they literally implant or, or expand out the root cells from hair, uh, implant them, and one has some success with this. It's not quite ready for prime time, but, but getting there, people are working on this. Uh, and then we can go down to the other extreme, to the fingers or toes, and one of, one of uh, our colleagues uh, working in our program is attempting to, uh, to use the ideas of regenerative medicine and tissue engineering to reconstruct uh, digits and uh, maybe someday even limbs. Uh, there's a number of companies that are also thinking along these lines. Uh, just to go through these quickly, this, this company, uh, uh, Odontis, they're talking about tissue engineering teeth. These all come off websites. Bioscaffolds is talking about trying to regenerate the human breast. Uh, here's Tengion, which is doing a, a, an artificial or tissue engineered bladder. Uh, here's uh, Circo Medicine, Medical doing a bio-artificial pancreas. So, uh, and this, again, we'll talk about some more companies out there. There's just lots of them out there, lots happening. Um, so, so how do we do this tissue engineering stuff? What, how would we actually go about doing it? Well, there's a couple of strategies, and this slide sort of lists a bunch of strategies. I'm not going to read the list, but what I'm going to do is show you an individual slide for a number of these, and you'll get to see some ideas about how people are thinking about it. One is sort of the cleverest, but maybe one that's still in the thought stage. This is uh, Thomas Boland. Thomas graduated from the University of Washington with a PhD in chemical engineering. I'd say about 1987 or 88 is my guess about when he graduated. Uh, Thomas uh, Boland uh, is a professor at Clemson University now, and he invented a whole new concept, which is basically using an inkjet printer to print tissues. 
Instead of those colored inks, can you put living cells in the inkjet cartridge and then do a computer program, say the tissue has these layers and these cells, and just get the, the inkjet cartridge to spit it out? Uh, you wouldn't think a cell could survive uh, the um, uh, momental forces and the heat and things that go in, a, in, in an inkjet cartridge, but Thomas has taken the chance and shown that it really works, and uh, he got written up in this magazine, uh, which is called uh, Business 2.0, I think was the name of it. Uh, and in fact, uh, got written up in many different magazines. Um, here, here's another interesting concept. It's called cell sheet engineering. And uh, it's the idea of you can grow living, living sheets of cells. Um, can you sort of stack them up and uh, build uh, thick tissues out of this? And uh, a uh, gentleman uh, named uh, Teruo Okano really is the originator of this idea. Uh, we are doing a lot of it here now at the University of Washington. We made our own invention, which is a special surface uh, cells like to grow at 37 degrees centigrade is body temperature, 98.6 basically. And living cells like to grow at 37. So we've invented the surface where the cells grow at 37. But if you just drop the temperature down to 25 degrees C, which is kind of room temperature instead of body temperature, the cell sheet spontaneously detaches. Now I have a little movie here. So my student, Zhuang Hong Sheng, uh, uh, grew the cells and then just dropped the temperature. And you can see the cell sheet just detaching off the surface there. This whole, central, this whole basic idea of cell sheet engineering was so exciting that the Japanese government has issued a stamp uh, based upon the use of these cell sheets for corneal uh, repair. And um, I, that's quite a credit to my uh, colleague and friend, Dr. Okano. Um, here's another central idea So, uh, in tissue engineering. It's sort of called cells and scaffolds. And I have some pictures down in the bottom here of, of what we call the scaffolds, which is sort of porous, sponge-like thing, sponge-like um, uh, constructs that give the cells something to, to, to crawl along and work along. And the basic idea here is we take some porous material, add some cells to it, and grow it up uh, in um, naively to a heart in a jar, and that would be a, quite a long stretch to do that at the moment, but we'll talk about it, how close or far we can get to that a little later. So, so let's talk about the scaffold idea is probably the, the predominant idea in tissue engineering, and um, why is a scaffold used? Well, uh, it provides a, a temporary support in workspace during construction and remodeling, and certainly that uh, describes what happened in Notre Dame. And how is the scaffold used? The scaffold reflects the size and shape of the finished structure. It might be a heart, it might be an ear, it might be uh, a kidney, but it reflects the size and shape of the finished structure. The scaffold is open and porous to allow transfer of construction materials, which are gonna be chemicals in the body of cells. And then uh, importantly, uh, when the work is all finished, the scaffold vanishes. And that's exactly what we try to do with our scaffolds too. Um, so, uh, again, this idea is sort of illustrated here. Uh, with, we start with a scaffold. We might mold it to the shape of an organ, seed it with cells. Um, interestingly, we have to get blood vessels to grow into that, to feed these cells. The cells need nutrition. By themselves, they just suffocate themselves out. And then uh, give them the right clues to grow into uh, an organ. And what I've described here is just a couple of the names of some of the synthetic polymers we make scaffolds out of. Uh, some cell types we use and some organs that could come out of that. But uh, th there's another important point in doing this is that we go in this progression from in vitro, it means in glass or in a test tube or in a bioreactor, eventually we have to go in vivo into the body and then where along this process we start uh, uh, in vitro and go in vivo is a lot of um, a place for sort of engineering and design. Here's some other nice diagrams supplied by uh, Jonathan Mansbridge, who was with one of the first major tissue engineering companies. It's called Advanced Tissue Sciences, and uh, uh, the company is no longer with us, but uh, Jonathan was very nice to supply these nice pictures of what the cells might look like on the scaffold at, uh, when they initially attach. In a few hours, they start to spread on the scaffold. And then by some period of time, they start giving off 
what we call extracellular matrix. The cells give off the stuff that makes the interconnections between the cells. So we don't have individual cells, but we have something that looks like a tissue. And that extracellular matrix has all sorts of interesting rich molecules in it. And this is really what a living metabolically active tissue looks like. Uh, two terms here, one is the, this tissue engineering uh, idea. And uh, engineering implies sort of an active process. Uh, engineering, a dictionary definition to plan, manage, and put through by skillful acts of contrivance. Well, it's not a bad definition of engineering. Uh, regenerative medicine, on the other hand, has an implication, more of a passive concept. The body will do the work. And uh, one way to think about regenerative medicine, there's some, uh, some creatures, some beasties, like this little salamander-like thing that lives down in Mexico. Uh, and you can uh, chop off a limb, and uh, the limb will, will just uh, go through a series of steps and grow back. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could do that with our uh, tissues and organs? Um, uh, interestingly, the liver is one of the few tissues in your body, or a few organs in your body, that will do that. You can take out uh, three quarters of the liver and, and, and it'll quickly grow back to a whole, a whole liver. But most other tissues in your, or organs in your body just, just don't do that. We don't know exactly why they're turned off, but in studying creatures like this, we sort of start learning some of the clues. Uh, and then we have some other ideas, uh, stem cells, embryogenesis, how does a normal embryo generate all this uh, stuff? Uh, fetal healing, the stories that fetuses heal major wounds uh, with no scar and perfect reconstruction. Why is that shut off in adults? Uh, wound healing in general and, and the subject of inflammation. So the, the tissue engineering challenge uh, uh, now, uh, let's see, what I'm gonna talk about is sort of the major tissues of the body. I'm gonna give you my opinions about what is our potential for replacing major opinions. And I got this kind of big list and we start up at the, at the top. I, I call it the, sort of the earliest successes, uh, the less, less challenging to more challenging really is how this goes. And things like bone, for example, also is one of these tissues that, that can repair itself to some extent. Uh, we can't, our body can't uh, regenerate major pieces of bone, but if we do get a break, we know we can heal that pretty well, and that's a scar-free healing a reconstruction. So uh, bone is already pretty close to a reality for tissue engineering. Uh, cartilage is another one that people are sort of doing already. Skin, cornea, we mentioned bladder, people are doing that. Um, you get down to some other of these things, uh, uh, we start going down the list, and at the body you have things like, like sort of some of the major complex organs, pancreas, kidney, heart. These would be um, uh, major accomplishments if we could do it. And I'll talk in a little while about heart repair and show you what some of the issues are, but also some of the, the successes uh, in this, uh, this challenge. So uh, we'll talk about two tissue engineering products, projects that are going on right now at the University of Washington. One is in heart muscle and one is in, in esophagus. And, and the heart muscle program is funded by the National Institutes of Health. It's a project we call BEAT, which stands for, it could stand for either bioengineered allogeneic or autologous tissue, either one, either from one human to another or from yourself back into yourself. But th this diagram down here shows you what a uh, nice medical textbook illustration, what heart muscle looks like. It illustrates some of our challenges. Uh, these um, bundle-like structures uh, are the heart muscle itself. The heart muscles, muscle cells are called cardiomyocytes. And of course, that's what we have to grow to reconstruct a part of the heart or a whole heart. Um, there's, there's a lot of other uh, components in this, but one thing I want to point out are these capillaries, and I have this four of them shown in this diagram. Within one cell of every cell in the heart, there's a blood vessel. The heart is among the most highly vascularized uh, organs in the body. The heart needs a tremendous uh, supply of oxygen and food to, to just keep on going. So our challenge, simple, would be to regrow a thing like that. Um, Another interesting fact about the cardiomyocytes is they, uh, in adults, they have no proliferative ability. In fact, within a few days of when you're born, you do not produce a single other heart muscle, heart muscle cell. Your heart muscle gets bigger, the cells get bigger, but you don't make new ones. Um, and uh, so um, if, when we lose them, that loss is pretty serious. Um, so that's one project. The other is, is esophagus, and uh, we're addressing uh, surgical replacements for cancer of the esophagus. 
this is a project funded by the government of Singapore to the University of Washington. And we call it the Singapore University of Washington Alliance. And uh, esophageal cancer is very common in Asia. Um, and, uh, but interestingly, the incidences in northern China and India are 10 to 100 times what they are in the United States. Still, there's 13,000 cases of esophageal cancer in the US. And it is the fastest growing, fastest rising cancer of all cancers we see in the Western world. If you need your esophagus removed, there are some surgical interventions they do now, but it leaves you in a rather sad way. Quality of life is low, and the uh, survival rate of five years is pretty low. So this program aims to tissue engineer an esophagus. Um, to do these two projects, we have what I call a list of science uh, and technology challenges. These, these, th th these are what make my work exciting, uh, challenging, uh, and uh, you know, we wish we could get beyond these so we could actually do make these medical devices. But uh, this is where my students, my researchers focus, is on things like this. And again, rather than read the list, so I'll go through a few of them, and we're going to start with the scaffolds and scaffold materials which is kind of an uh, interesting area. We, we have a whole bunch of criteria to do these scaffolds. We wanted to make a scaffold to grow a tissue on. Well, it starts with it should be biodegradable, meaning that it's there when we grow the cells, and then when the cells are grown, it, it disappears. Uh, and we have a, you know, a whole bunch of other things instructed to the cells. It should talk to the cells. It's more than just inert. It should be sterilizable, of course. It has to be mechanically appropriate. For a bone scaffold, we want it rigid. For a heart scaffold, we want it flexible. Uh, it has to uh, allow this, an this angiogenesis, um, uh, this um, uh, growth of blood vessels so we can feed the tissue. Uh, and uh, let's see, at the very bottom, let me just mention, uh, it would be helpful if uh, we could uh, get it through the FDA. The FDA represents a very special challenge that we have in medicine, uh, but we know quite a bit about that. So we, we got an important uh, clue about the pore structure uh, of, of our scaffolds. And the clue came from some experiments that were done by implantations in, in mice. Uh, this is the sort of area where you, you just have to use an animal. There are no other models that will tell us how things heal in complex organisms. So why a mouse? Well, a mouse happens to heal much like a human. And so we did some implantations. And it's also important to understand what happens in healing. And this is a pretty complicated slide. I tend not to like such complicated slides, but uh, it's the only way to really explain this process. So if we start at, at number one, which is up on the top here, um, the, the kind of bluish thing, I call it a biomaterial. It's, it's a, maybe a medical device. Maybe it's a scaffold. And if we're going to put this in the body, that's basically uh, the implantation, which is an injury. And uh, in number two, proteins adsorb. Proteins are throughout your body, and they stick to the surface. And then some cells start coming in, number three, a cell called a neutrophil. It's mostly looking for bacteria. Uh, if it doesn't find bacteria, and we should have a sterile thing that we put in, another cell comes along called the macrophage. And the macrophage is set up by nature to, to get rid of foreign objects. It's going to engulf foreign objects and eat them up. And the macrophage hits our synthetic biomaterial, and the macrophage is a pretty small cell. A medical device or biomaterial is a pretty big thing. It just can't get around it. It tries to engulf it, tries to eat it up. That's number four. And, and, and it just can't do it. So what it does is sort of fuse with its brethren and make a giant cell, a huge multinucleated cell. It's still trying to engulf the material. It still can't do it. It's frustrated. Finally, it sends off some signals to another kind of cell called a fibroblast. And the fibroblast, what it does is make a, uh, a capsule around it. It isolates that foreign thing from the body. The body knows it's foreign. It knows that nature didn't intend that to be with us. And it, it walls it off. And that's what happens with materials in the body. Uh, and obviously, we wouldn't want our organ to be walled off in, in a, um, a bag, uh, a bag of collagen is what it is. So we have to sort of watch out for this. So here, here's the experiment, the clue about pore structure that's very important to us. Um, what we have here, this is based on one of those mouse implants. And this is a histology experiment. And you know, there's a lot, of course, in reading histology slides, microscope slides and all. But there's two things I, I want you to notice. If, if we look 
uh, on this slide, what we see is the tissue reaction to one material. And uh, I'm kind of moving the cursor there. I hope you can all see that where, where I'm pointing. This is, if you read histology slides, this is a classic, what we call a foreign body reaction. This is this dense encapsulation. Now, uh, on the other side of the slide, uh, we have a, a material, it's chemically identical material, but it has bigger pores. It has holes or pores in it. And I think even from the very back of the room, you can see that, 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 that this structure and the structure, this structure, look very different. In fact, what, what happened here is we got something that looks more like normal healing. And if you look very closely, you'd find blood vessels through it. It looks like normal tissue, where on the other side, we get this dense bag. So how did we get this? Well, we adjusted the pores, the holes in this material in the correct way. So um, we know we can do some interesting things with these porous scaffolds to avoid that encapsulation, that walling off. And we have lots of different ways. This is a, a, what I call my little tool chest of ways, tools that I have as an engineer to make porous scaffolds. And uh, this is the subject of one entire lecture in one of my classes. So we're not going to uh, go into that. But we're going to talk about just one of them, which is called microsphere templating, and just show you how we can achieve some interesting things. And, and, and here's what we do. We take uh, microspheres. These spheres uh, are uh, about half the diameter of human hair. That'll give you an idea of the size. They're pretty small spheres. They look like dust or powder. Uh, and um, what we do is, because the, the, they come to us in all different sizes, we sieve them to get uniform size. And then we, we shake them tightly, and they kind of pack together like close-packed oranges uh, to make a, 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 a sort of a, a very attractive, almost crystalline array. And then we, once they're like that, we gently heat them, and the spheres uh, center or fuse with each other. You can sort of see in this diagram, they've just fused with each other, sort of become a solid mass. And uh, then we, we surround them with a liquid. And then what we do is we solidify that liquid. It's called polymerizing a monomer. We make a polymer there, and that's kind of polymerized around our spheres. And then finally, we solubilize that. We take a solvent and dissolve out the spheres, leaving interconnected spaces uh, in that material. And that's our final uh, scaffold. So in, in this process, we do uh, sieve, shake, sinter, surround, solidify, solubilize. We call this uh, success, and it has led to success. Thank you. Um, in, in any event, here's what the, uh, the material looks like. It's, it's kind of a, you know, a very uniform, attractive material. It's kind of dark. Black, well, those black dots there are the interconnects between the living the cells. This is sort of a closer up one. Um, I, I kind of like this. We did a cut through the material, and just based on a cut, we kind of got a Mickey Mouse here. So I thought that was cute. Um, and, but here's the results when they were implanted. This was the work of PhD student Andrew Marshall, now Dr. Marshall, and uh, the results were quite remarkable. What we're looking at in this graph is blood vessel density. How much blood vessels are, are produced? And if the pore size is just right, the 35 microns, we get huge, prolific blood vessel growth, which can be used to feed tissues, where if the pore size is wrong, 160 microns, kind of great big pores, or if we had a, a solid material that actually looks just like the 160, we don't get, we get uh, things that, that are very avascular and more collagenous or more uh, uh, encapsulating. So that's really what we, we want. And, and so what's going on there? Again, I talked about these macrophage cells. And, and on the bottom diagram here, we have sort of a solid material. And the macrophages kind of come along. And they uh, attempt to fuse and engulf it and, and again, get frustrated. And uh, uh, they um, uh, lead to encapsulation. If you have great big pores, these pores are like, almost like individual ballrooms to these cells. And they can go in there and they can still spread out. And they still go into this form where they lead to the encapsulation. But in the middle space, if the pores are just right, the macrophages crawl in there. But then they're kind of trapped. They're constrained within the pore. And uh, so we think we're sort of uh, tricking them into preventing them from going into this spreading form that causes all our trouble. And that's what leads to this nice healing thing. I'll show you a little bit later how we're going to use those very scaffolds for doing some, some real healing. 
Uh, angiogenesis, uh, we just saw an example of angiogenesis. These materials, angiogenesis is producing blood vessels, and our uh, uh, sphere-templated 6S materials produce blood vessels. I, I'd like to talk about another sort of approach, which is called decellularized natural tissue. It's also kind of interesting. And uh, th there's a material which is shown in this diagram called small intestinal submucosa. Uh, and it comes from the small intestine. And uh, basically, it's, it's a, uh, a lining from the small intestine, which uh, all the cells are taken out of. And it looks kind of like that. And uh, this has been used in almost over 300,000 surgeries in humans. This isn't the combination of materials and cells. It's just the materials, but it has a great healing capacity. And so we do some, a lot of this sort of natural tissue in tissue engineering because they do seem to stimulate healing and they do stimulate uh, blood vessel growth and angiogenesis. On the other hand, since we're using natural tissue, we do worry about viral issues. We worry about reproducibility, how reproducible is one animal for another, depending on where it's been and what it's eating. Again, there's immunologic issues and how do you sterilize and store natural tissues. There's pros and cons to this stuff. But anyway, we're quite interested in this. And we did a process called cell extraction. Uh, so that's really pretty simple. Uh, uh, cells in your tissues in your body grow in something called an extracellular matrix. It's the matrix that separates the cells, holds the cells together. And what we do is use some uh, uh, biological tricks to dissolve the cells out and just leave the extracellular matrix behind. That's the decellularized material. And uh, so we've been applying that to esophagus. This, this, this is, a, again, a medical or a histological diagram, a uh, microscope image of a cross section of an esophagus. And uh, in, in this kind of diagram, the, the food goes down someplace up here. There's a, uh, a lining layer. These uh, dark purple things are cells. Uh, and the, the epithelial lining of the esophagus, that, by the way, is the problem where cancer starts. And, and this is sort of muscle cells back in the back. And, and if we're going to grow um, uh, esophagus, we have to do that. that. That epithelial layer is shown in this little cartoon here, which shows thick, plump cells on the bottom going to these sort of flat, squishy cells that kind of just slough, slough off uh, on top. And that's a typical epithelial tissue. So um, again, th this is the same diagram of the esophagus. We tried seeding these esophageal, esophageal epithelial cells. This is the work of, of, of Professor C.C. Kelly in our group and Ben Beckstead. C.C. Uh, Kelly is also a professor in bioengineering and working on the SUA project. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Ben is the PhD student and Ben tried to seed some cells on the, um, these materials. And, and we got the cells to sort of live, but it really didn't look anything like an esophagus, the final thing we grew. On the other hand, if we took that acellular esophagus, we took a, an animal esophagus, decellularized it, left just the extracellular matrix behind, and put the cells back on, and the cells reconstructed themselves in a way that looks just like, a, and you'll have to believe me, sometimes it looks a little different in these diagrams, but basically it looks just like how uh, uh, an esophageal lining should look like. The cells reconstructed themselves. They knew they were on the right thing, they received the right signals, and they went right ahead and reconstructed. So that was kind of cell signaling. Now, as I said, we get back to angiogenesis. It's one of our greatest challenges. Uh, there's some things we can do about that. Again, this is sort of my tool chest. We have a lot of different ways to do this. I'll show you some quick examples of a few things. Uh, for one thing, we can sort of feed the tissue what's called growth factors. And there's, there's one, in this case, this is called a basic fibroblast growth factor. It's a protein. And without the basic fibroblast growth factor, we have very little blood vessels. And with it, we get prolific blood vessels. This is the work of, of Dr. Robert Vernon, who is a research scientist at the Benny Roya Research Institute in Seattle and is one of the collaborators on this project. So we can use these growth factors to induce blood vessels. Uh, Bob Vernon has also envisioned that we might be able to sort of grow artificial networks, literally create an artificial network that would feed the tissue until blood vessels grow in. And then the, the artificial network would dissolve away. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but this is some of, of the sort of uh, blood vessel networks he, he's made. And these, are, uh, these uh, tubes and blood vessel networks are smaller than the diameter of a hair, a human hair. So these are pretty small. And, and you know, so there's some sort of engineering tricks you might do to, to make this happen. Uh, another one of our colleagues on this program, uh, Dr. Margaret Allen, 
uh, has been, and uh, Margaret is a heart surgeon, and uh, she's shown how we can use what's called the omental flap. So in your gut, you have this flap of tissue that covers the gut, that's very highly vascularized. And what she's literally doing is showing for heart repair that one can take this omental flap from the gut, pull it up through the diaphragm, and place it on the heart to get better blood vessel growth in the heart. It's another surgical trick you can use. Um, let's see, I have some other slides here. Dr. Margaret Allen has also shown that we can upregulate a protein. We can increase the amount of protein in a cell. It's called a heat shock protein. It makes the cells tougher. And what she, she's demonstrated is, is that she can keep heart muscle alive. She, she's actually, it's kind of a strange experiment, but she's taken heart muscle from a mouse and put it under the skin. And normally that heart muscle would die because there's no blood vessels. But because she's upregulated this protein that makes it tougher, uh, she can keep the heart muscle alive. So it's a very exciting result. And this is just some data to, 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 to sort of prove the increased survival, the uh, kind of purplish uh, uh, tall bar shows increased survival for those cells she's treated. But we, we've gotten with the heart project, we've also gotten some very interesting results with stem cells. And the stem cells, uh, of course, are uh, subject of much discussion and perhaps controversy, but they do come from the blastocyte form of, of, of a growing uh, egg, pre-fetus stage, a blastocyte stage. And we take from these, this inner cell mass we take these embryonic stem cells out, and we can differentiate them to all the different possible cells in the body, all the different germ layers of tissue. And um, this is some work that's done by uh, Professor Charles Murray, Chuck Murray, and uh, uh, Todd McDivitt. Todd got his PhD in bioengineering, is now a professor at Georgia Tech. And uh, they started uh, saying, let's do some experiments with mouse embryonic stem cells. This seems much less controversial than humans. And again, without going through the details, basically they found the mouse embryonic stem cells just didn't grow. Uh, they couldn't get it to grow. Uh, they could make the mouse embryonic stem cells convert to the cell called the cardiomyocyte, which is the brown staining. But uh, like, like heart cells, after you're born, they just wouldn't grow. So uh, they, they really had, couldn't develop the source of cells. But uh, by continual experimentation, uh, they did some work. Uh, th this is some work on human embryonic stem cells. Uh, this is the, the uh, George W. Bush approved number H7 line, which means I won't get arrested for talking about this work and sponsoring it. Uh, but we can use this, this, this line of cells for at least experimental purposes. Uh, we can't use this clinically for various reasons. But uh, basically, Chuck Murray and Todd McDivitt made this cell differentiate to the cardiomyocytes, to the heart cells, and then grow. This might be the first time in history anybody's ever grown heart cells. So you ask, we want to rebuild the heart. Where do we get the heart cells from? We don't have a cell that grows. Well, Todd and Chuck have done that. It's a remarkable piece of work. So now we have cells, heart cells, this rare cell from the heart. And can we put it into the scaffold that can induce the angiogenesis, shape it like, like a part of the heart muscle? Uh, so um, uh, working with, with another uh, one of our postdoctoral fellows, Stephanie Bryant. And Stephanie has now become a uh, professor uh, at the um, uh, University of Colorado. Uh, we invented a process to take that sphere-templated material Here's the sphere templated material, and make some bigger channels in it. These bigger channels allow us to get cells in, give us another way to get nutrients in, and yet the small channels allow these blood vessels to grow in very rapidly. And uh, so putting it all together, uh, we were able to show that the cardiomyocytes thrive within the sphere templated material. Again, I'm not going to go through all the histology, but basically this shows the heart cells thrive, and, and interestingly, down here, we have some staining for a cell called the endothelial cell. That means the blood vessels are coming into this, and that's what we want. Those heart muscles cells need blood vessels to sustain them. And this is a, uh, a movie of the um, cardiomyocyte cells in that sphere-templated scaffold. And this is exactly what we want to see. The heart muscle cells are growing, they're fusing, they're beating in synchrony, and they're in the sphere-templated material that can now be implanted into heart muscle, which is exactly what's happening now. So anyway, we have our challenges. We've been through a number of these. Uh, I, th I think we are indeed rising to these challenges. We're learning how to deal with them one at a time. 
So how will tissue engineering enter the mainstream of clinical medicine? Well, I think companies have to adopt it for this to happen. And there are some technology commercialization barriers before it'll ever reach the hospitals and just the average person laying in bed waiting for a part. Uh, again, we, we have to figure out where the cell sources are gonna come from. Will they come from the, the, the patient himself? Will they come from other humans? Will they come from animals? Uh, we, we have to set up a manufacturing uh, endeavor to manufacture not one heart piece of heart muscle, but probably hundreds of thousands, millions in fact, millions of pieces of heart muscle could be used. Uh, we'll have to learn how to sterilize living tissue. We'll have to get through FDA regulation. And then there has to be uh, uh, both the established markets and business models for companies to want to invest. Companies exist uh, be, to return uh, value to their stockholders, and they have to think about that. And it would be great to just think about what we could do for humanity. So uh, how, how are we going to translate these smart things we do in the laboratory to developments that are going to help patients, that are going to generate economic value? So we talk about uh, the business models. Well, for start, we can throw out that number. In principle, we could address a $400 billion market in tissue engineering. Now, that right away gets the attention of most investors. $400 billion is a good number. So as I say, investors are looking for these buns, big unmet needs, uh, and here we got a great one. One of the classic models would say we, we might have a stock room, and the stock room would have a, a, a bunch of containers of hearts and maybe some kidneys and, and how about some lungs and eyes, and the surgeon needs one, goes into the stock room, grabs it off the shelf. The dermograph material is an example of, of, of such a material. Uh, but today, most of the tissue engineering is done, I would call it surgeon -driven, driven. People like Professor Atala at Wake Forest um, does the work, uh, and um, he uses autologous tissue, he uses the tissue from his own patients, grows it up, puts it on a scaffold, and puts it back into the patient. Uh, Professor Atala is actually working on a company to uh, commercialize that whole process and bring it into hospitals. Uh, in the future, it, it may be more company-driven. Uh, it may be allogeneic tissue. So in other words, it would be some human source that would go to the whole human species, and it would be sort of parts off the shelf. Um, I, I think these are the sorts of things. I've mentioned most of these already that we really have to get through for commercialization, namely these big unmet needs and to give return on investment and FDA and reimbursement issues. We've got a lot of things to think about. Well, there are lots of new tissue engineering companies. Um, uh, Don Applegate, uh, an old colleague and friend, has started a company in California. Here's uh, Professor Atala uh, doing the bladder company, another company uh, selling silk scaffolds uh, for uh, bone tissue engineering. Uh, but interestingly, let me just mention in the last few slides, I, I think there's great potential for the state of Washington in this. We have real leadership in this state. I mean international leadership uh, in biomaterials and medical devices. UWeb uh, is known throughout the world as being possibly the leader in the whole world in this area, and that's in our state. And that's the, one of the starting points for tissue engineering. We have the world-class molecular and cell biology. We are among the best in the whole world in that. We have a, a strong and innovative medical community, and uh, we have an entrepreneurial community in town. We have a newly developing stem cell initiative in, in the state of Washington, and much tissue engineering is already happening. Heart, esophagus, cornea, bone, digits, gut, heart valve, thymus, blood vessels. These are all happening right now in our state. And uh, so I, I've talked about uh, developing, I am developing right now, and thinking of a way to, to, to bring together a consortium, hopefully with, with, with some uh, encouragement and support from the state of Washington, which would be called Washington Engineered Tissue Initiative. And it actually has a very appropriate acronym uh, for the state of Washington, it's uh, the Wet Eye Initiative. But uh, uh, we're hoping the Wet Eye Initiative can make the state of Washington as a, uh, again, a world commercial leader and a world medical leader in this exciting area called tissue engineering. So thank you very much. I'd be pleased to take questions. Yeah. When you're engineering tissue, what's your experience with tissues that go haywire and overproduce or produce mutations that are contrary to what you're going for? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very valid question and one that, that has concerned us. It, it's, 
there are things we don't know about this. For example, we can take these tissues you know, in, in the test tube in, in a Petri dish and grow tremendous amounts of tissue, yet in the body, the body does seem to give tissue often an instruction. It says, this is enough. You've done just fine. Stop growing. So uh, we don't know the exact mechanism, but the history of things, for example, like that bladder, the cells didn't just keep on proliferating. They were told, you know, you, you have achieved what you're supposed to achieve. And then mechanisms with the body uh, have, have uh, sort of helped us along. So we do have uh, some core of healing and regenerative ability. It's largely turned off in adult humans, but there is some of it left. And what we sometimes say is if we can give the body the right head start, get it going in the right direction, the body can take it the rest of the way. Uh, and that's what's happening. You know, another example of that is the blood vessel growth. Uh, the blood vessels grow into the right density. Uh, uh, cancerous tissue also uh, has blood vessels growing in, but the tissue just keeps on growing and the blood vessels make it bigger and bigger. We don't see that in, in the uh, successes in tissue engineering. So we can sort of maybe a bit heave a sigh of relief that uh, that's not the major problem, but it doesn't seem to be. But it's still a very real concern and one we keep on watching. And I'm sure the FDA is going to watch it, too. They're going to want good evidence that uh, these won't turn into tumor-like constructs. Are there natural substances or uh, organisms that have used this pore size property to defeat the body's uh, defense mechanisms? And if not, why not? Well, that's a very good question. Um, when one looks at, you know, I, I, I sort of mentioned if we extract the cells out of natural tissue, we're left with an extracellular matrix that has a pore-like structure. Uh, but the structure is, uh, you know, clearly very complicated. It's not uniform like ours. I, I think by making this absolutely uniform pore structure, we can tune in exactly the ideal uh, shape, which maybe nature didn't feel the need to do. Um, you know, it's possible in some uh, uh, marine organisms that form very uniform uh, uh, calcium, uh, uh, calcium carbonate skeletons, uh, sea urchins and things like that, that there may be uh, th this type of pore structure within it. But we don't really see anything like what we've created in, in humans. And yet porosity is the norm. Uh, bone has large porous areas. Uh, the extracellular matrix has porous areas, and um, we're just um, doing sort of an engineering trick to get it exact. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>